Finance. Hey, welcome everybody to the Mad Scientist Financial Independence Podcast, a podcast where I get inside the brains of some of the best and brightest in the personal finance space to find out how they achieved financial independence. Before I introduce my guest today, I want to thank everyone for all the feedback that I've gotten on the travel card tool that I created. Um, and if you're not aware of the tool that I built, uh, it's a credit card search tool for travel hackers. Um, I just realized that there was no good way to find the best sign-up bonuses for travel credit cards because that whole world is just completely complicated with lots of different flexible points that transfer to programs at different ratios. And it's just a, it's a nightmare to keep up with. So I've decided to use my programming skills to create a web application to do it. Um, so you can just click the airline and hotel programs that are most valuable to you. And then it'll show you the sign up bonuses that are most lucrative. So um, if you haven't checked it out yet, definitely go to cards.madfientist.com. Um, now that I've stopped working, I plan to build out uh, some more travel hacking tools and improve the uh, travel credit card tools. So I'd love to get any feedback that you have. So just send me an email at fi at madfinetist.com if you have any. And uh, thanks to everyone that's already shared their feedback because it's uh, been very helpful and I've already implemented some of your suggestions. So on today's show, I'm excited to bring back Doug Nordman, aka Nords from the militaryguide.com. You'll recall Doug took part in the panel discussion at Camp Mustache that I recently released, and I wanted to get him back on the show to talk about his story more in depth and to find out how it's been being retired for the last 14 years. Doug retired when he was 41, and he's been retired ever since, and uh, I just wanted to get his feedback on what it's been like and what he's been up to, and also to dive into the story a little bit behind how he was able to do it uh, when he was serving in the military. So his entire career, I believe, was spent in the military. So I'm excited to get him on the show. So without further delay, hey, Doug, thanks a lot for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's great to be here. I really enjoyed the uh, panel podcast that we did at Camp Mustache a few months ago. I know. That was fantastic. Uh, it hasn't actually been released yet, so I'm hoping to get that out next week, which I'm so excited about. I was just Actually, this morning, I was just editing the audio some more, and uh, it's just fantastic. So I appreciate you uh, taking part in that and uh, joining me on a one-on-one, which is going to be uh, great as well. So, um, so yeah, for people in my audience who may not know about your story, could you just uh, give us a little background? Yeah, I uh, was in the uh, U.S. Navy submarine force for 20 years, and I retired from there in uh, 2002 at the age of 41. Uh, my wife is also in the Navy, in the Navy Reserve, and uh, these days our daughter is also in the Navy. Uh, when I retired back in 2002, uh, my wife and I were financially independent, and uh, we decided not to seek a bridge career, not to go right back to work like, like so many military do. So we've uh, enjoyed the last 14 years. We uh, live in Hawaii. I, I love surfing. I don't know if you've noticed how much surfing pops up on my site or in my book. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay, it's coming through. But we've, uh, we've found a lot of information that's very helpful to the military, and I've been uh, very busy over the last five years with the book and the blog, letting everybody know that they, too, can achieve financial independence uh, in the military if they stick around to retirement, or even if they only do one service obligation in the military. It's still putting you on the path to uh, financial independence. Right. All right. So lots of lots, lots of questions popping up there. But uh, first, the yep. most important thing, um, you're also a Pittsburgh boy, right? <laughs> I did. I grew up in tiny little Murraysville, Pennsylvania, and graduated from tinier little Franklin Regional High School in 1978. <laughs> nice. nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, we were... That's why I joined the Navy. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, and you also spent some time in Scotland, so we have very similar paths, although they're very different journeys, I would say. I would hope so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so let's let's go back a bit and uh, start talking about, you know, the, the decision to join the Navy and... Uh, was it obviously there's a lot of benefits to being in the military, which we'll touch on. Um, but was that your driving force or was it something else? Well, there are there two driving forces. The first one was the horrific winter weather that we had in Pittsburgh in my <laughs> senior year in high school. I uh, had a huge pile of snow at the end of the driveway. I still have a picture of that today that I refer to and I call it why Doug joined the Navy. <laughs> The other thing was the uh, older brother of a best friend, and I, I'm saying this to a serious military audience and to all you impressionable young teenagers and high school students and uh, college students out there, that it looked really, really good when I was watching my friend's older brother home on leave. He had a great lifestyle. I was very impressed with everything he was doing at the U.S. Naval Academy, and I thought I'd like to do some of that, too. So I did. And after I got to the Naval Academy, I, I have a reputation of being rather persistent, stubborn, perhaps obstinate, beyond the point where it serves any useful purpose. 
and I managed to do quite a bit of that in the Naval Academy so that I graduated and was commissioned into the U.S. Navy and into the submarine force. And over the years, I had never expected that I would go 20 years. I always thought that I was going to serve just one more obligation of two or three years and then figure out what I really wanted to do when I grew up. Uh, and after 20 years of that, I ended up retiring from the U.S. Navy, and it was a big surprise to me, even today, that I managed to get through that 20 years. So when you see somebody in the Navy who looks like they're having a lot of fun, dig a little deeper and, and learn a little bit more about their lifestyle, not just what they do when they're on liberty and on leave. So you mentioned 20 years. So that's, uh, is that the time that you know you become vested in your pension when you're in the military? Is that, is that why you were saying that number? Or? Right, right. That's the military's minimum time that you need to stay on active duty or in the reserves or in the National Guard to reach the eligibility to retire and get a pension. And by doing 20 years of service, I started my pension in 2002 at age 41. And so I had an inflation-adjusted pension coming in as reliable income every year. It's been over 14 years now. And most people use that as the springboard to figure out what they really want to do with their lives after the military. They uh, can stay on the military. They can continue to serve until they uh, reach their uh, final rank and the number of years that they're allowed to serve. Or they can go out and start a civilian bridge career, or they can start an entrepreneurial career and do whatever they want to do. Or, like me, when we reached financial independence, we decided that uh, we could always go find a career or a job if we wanted to, but I really didn't have anything that interested me, and I wanted to spend more time with family. Right, and so so the pension didn't cover all of your spending at when, the, when you turned 41. You had also done a lot of saving and investing prior to that, correct? Right. We had saved and invested every year of that 20 years. And as we uh, got more senior in our ranks after the first couple of years when we got a promotion and uh, kept on getting promoted from there, we began to save as much as we could. My wife and I were both on active duty, so we always tried to save at least 40% of our income. And and you've probably seen the math before. It turns out that if you can save 40% of your gross income, that after about 20 years, you'll be financially independent. So the way the math worked for us was that we had had enough in our savings and investments by the time I retired at 20 years to use the 4% safe withdrawal rate. And we started doing that when I retired. We also uh, managed to have the pension as a backstop. We reached financial independence a couple of years before I retired from the military, and we didn't expect that I would retire from the military. So that was an absolutely nice bonus to have on top of our savings and investments. Right. Okay. So, so you, when you turned 41, you did start taking 4% out every year. Um, cause I get a lot of questions of people asking me, it's like, you know, I, I write about it a lot. A lot of other financial bloggers write about the 4% rule a lot. Um, but <laughs> very few actually take out 4% every year because they have some sort of other income coming in or something, or, you know, some circumstances cause them not to actually do that, but you actually did that um, when, as soon as you stopped working. And uh, if so, how did that feel? Oh, it's, it, it feels a little terrifying because <laughs> the first thing we did in 2002, we retired at the peak of the tech wreck. The NASDAQ reached its bottom a couple of months after I retired, and then things started to recover. After five years, we got into 2007 and thought things were looking pretty shiny and rosy. And then all of a sudden, the economy locked up again and gave us the biggest recession that our generation's ever seen. So we've been through 14 years of financial independence, including two world-class recessions. I hope those are the only two I encounter, but I suspect I'm going to see a couple more. And the 4% rule still worked. I, I have the pension coming in to cover basic expenses, but we also track on a spreadsheet, our net worth, and we track how our finances would be doing if I did not have the pension and if I was only surviving on the 4% safe withdrawal rate. And as you know, the math says that when you retire with a greater than a 90% probability of success, that nine times out of 10, you end up with more money than you need. That's been exactly our experience. We have a very high equity asset allocation But even though two recessions have gone by, and even though we haven't really added to the portfolio at all since we uh, reached financial independence and retired, today we have not just enough, but more than enough that we need for the rest of our lives. So the 4% safe withdrawal rate has a lot of flaws in the computer simulation in the study. But lifestyle and human behavior and being able to change your spending over the years, that makes up for all the flaws of the 4% safe withdrawal rate studies. Right, right. So have you found that, like, for instance, like, I can't imagine my spending is going to be increasing with inflation every year. In fact, like the past three years, I think every year I've gone down in spending. Um, 
And I, I imagine that's going to be even more the case this year as I have stopped working. So um, how have you found your spending habits to have been over the past 14 years? You're absolutely right. And I think that research is going to show in the next couple of years that and actually put some numbers on how much retirement spending drops after you leave the workforce. And we all know that when you retire, that you're not going to have to spend as much for office attire or for commuting expenses. But I don't think it adequately quantifies that you can find a lot of bargains in your life. You can go back and review all your bills and utility expenses and insurance expenses, and you can take a really good hard look at what you're spending your money on in retirement because you have more time to analyze your spending. And once you do that, you find that your expenses probably drop a a little bit over the first two or three years of retirement. Now, everybody goes through the initial party phase where you're uh, traveling to visit friends and you're spending more time with family and maybe taking a fantasy vacation or two. But over the long term, uh, and there's some research to indicate that this is actually happening for most of society, your spending gradually declines in retirement. Uh, One of the guys who's done the best job at quantifying that is a a retirement researcher named Wade Fowle. And he's found what he calls the retirement smile. (laughs) Your uh, spending drops over the next 10 to 20 years of retirement. And as you reach end of life, medical expenses mainly, it does go up a little bit. But in general, financial advisors have known this for years, that the majority of their clients, once they retire, they uh, spend a little more than they expected at first, maybe the first year or two. And then in the long term, their spending actually goes down. Their personal inflation rate is below the consumer price index, and they find money, better things to spend their money on and enjoy their life without having to worry about their retirement portfolio. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's, yeah, that's definitely something I found, even though I've only been out of work for a month where my wife and I are going to be doing a trip around the world uh, for the rest of the year, starting in September. And I've started booking it. Um, and obviously, you know, travel hacking helps with all the the big expenses like flights. Um, but even just booking these long term rentals where we're going to be like I just this morning, I just booked some hotels in Mexico and it was it was like wow. $28 a night or something. And, you know, the food's going to be a lot cheaper than it is here in Scotland. And um, everything about our life is going to be a lot cheaper. And yet we're going to be doing something really fun and rewarding, like, uh, you know, slow traveling through uh, Central and South America. So, um, so yeah, it's it's exciting to think about all the ways that cost will be decreasing. And it just shows that, you know, the 4% rule is even more robust because um, that, in, that takes into account that you're going to be increasing your spending every year when in actuality you probably won't. That's right. And if a recession comes up, you may actually cut back on your spending. Uh, while you're on your world travels, your biggest problem may be deciding whether you're really ready to move on from the place you're staying or whether you want to extend that a little week or two more. Right, exactly. Um, and now, now talking about recessions and things. So you've obviously in your investing career, you've survived Black Monday, you know, the doc dot-com bubble bursting, um, financial crisis in 2008. And it was probably your mental state in each of those was probably quite different because one of them you're, you know, working and earning a lot and saving 40%. Um, the other one, you know, you're about to retire or just having retired. And then, uh, the, the most recent crisis, uh, you've were, you were retired and you've been retired for many years. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, how it was surviving those periods and how, how different they were to you? Absolutely. I, uh, I started investing in college, and that was right around the time when Business Week came out with their cover story on the death of equities. <laughs> and, uh, we were all, at, at that point in our lives, expecting to invest in uh, gold bullion and raw diamonds. <laughs> and that stock market bottomed out a few years after that period. When we got to Black Monday, uh, the big crash in 1987, uh, I was not very sophisticated in my investment techniques, but I was aware enough to know that this was on sale. You know, Buffett, Warren Buffett talks about when the price of hamburger goes down, the Buffett household cheers, and there's a lot of cheering in our house. We uh, scrambled around and pulled all the spare change out of the sofa cushions and sent it out to our investments, and we were handsomely rewarded for doing that, although I'll tell you, we were blissfully ignorant of what could have happened. <laughs> when we uh, got into the uh, recession of 2002, the tech wreck, uh, we knew that we had enough to, to do the 4% safe withdrawal rate. Uh, I don't know how many of your listeners remember this, but the stock market was actually closed for a number of days after 11 September 2001. And when the stock market reopened, it dropped 1,700 points during one day. And at the end of that day, I uh, took what was left of our portfolio and ran it through all the financial independence calculators that were available back in 2001. And they all said, there's enough. It's not a big safety margin, but it meets the 4% rule. You have enough. 
So when we retired in June of 2002, even though the market had not yet bottomed for a few more months, we knew that we were probably going to be okay. And I had just retired, so plan B would always be to go out and get some kind of uh, part-time employment or even start a bridge career. Well, and that, I, and that's, that, I think that's a great point to, to emphasize as well. Like um, A lot of people email me and they're really concerned about the 4% rule and all mm-hmm. these things. And you know, these are people that are in their 30s or 40s. And my thinking is always, if you've put yourself into a position where this is even a possibility at your age, then you're obviously a hardworking person who you, you know is more than likely able to generate some income if they need to. Um, so that's always an option uh, rather than working for an extra decade to have way more money than you're ever going to be able to use in your life and you know give away a decade of your life doing something you don't like. I agree, and there's no traditional three-phase plan of your life anymore coming up for the millennial generation. I think it's encouraging to see it across all the generations where instead of going and getting an education and then spending 20 or 30 years working and then the rest of your life playing, I think we're going to bounce back and forth among those various phases. I, I do want to point out, though, that when the recession of 2008 came along, that even though we had all this investing experience and even though we knew all the numbers and had done all the cold hearted Vulcan logical analysis of our finances, it still hurts. When you watch the stock market melting down like an ice cube on a hot sidewalk, hmm. even though you know you have enough money to pay your bills and you have plenty of money to live for the rest of your life, it still hurts to watch that melt away. And the best thing emotionally is to just stop looking at your bank statements for a while because you know you have an asset allocation plan and you know it's going to work and you know it just needs time to recover. There's no reason to check it every 10 minutes and just upset yourself. Right. Yeah, no, great advice. Um, I'd like to step back a little bit uh, and just sort of talk about what it was like. You just graduated from the Naval Academy and you said that you pretty much came right out of the gate saving a pretty big percentage of your paycheck. Um can, can you talk about like sort of what motivated that and how you made that decision? I, I, I probably am hardwired to be fairly frugal and to be the kind of person who always tries to save money. So it helps if you're already in, in your genome able to start doing that. And, and I, when I was a younger kid, I can remember that there were times when I wanted money and I didn't have money and I had to go work for it. So I got into that savings mindset even in early in high school. When I graduated and started my career, uh, saving was actually a lot easier than it sounds because I was working so hard. You uh, spend a lot of time uh, as a young Navy officer uh, learning your trade and going to sea duty. And uh, when you're at sea, you don't really have to spend much money. At, uh, at you're all, all your needs are provided and you're working too hard to really have much time to spend a lot of money in the first place. So the combination of learning my job and all the time we spent at sea and the fact that I would find other ways to entertain myself, that all worked in my favor. And there is a big uh, challenge for people that are just starting their career in the military that when you come back to shore from sea or when that deployment ends or when you're done with your mission, you feel like you're entitled to spend a little money on yourself and do something nice for yourself. And maybe you need a big high lift four wheel drive pickup truck as well to go with that. And so the trick is to make sure that you understand that you should be saving your money for retirement and to put that in, in autopilot as much as you can. And also not to make yourself feel entitled after every arduous task that you finish. The trick is to continue to be frugal, even though when you're working in your military job, you quite frequently encounter deprivation. The key is that you know where the line is between deprivation and frugality, and you just have to make sure that you stay challenged and fulfilled and enjoying the savings that you're saving for without feeling like you're deprived. Right. And during your naval career, you spent lots of time... Uh, underwater and some submarines. Is that correct? That's right. We used to go out on the submarine patrols for up to 90 days at a time. So you'd be un- underwater for literally for 90 days, uh, unless the guy that was coming out to take over for you uh, was a little late. And so we had one that went out to 97 days. That's a that's a personal record. Uh, and that's probably a club that nobody wants to be a member of. <laughs> so this is completely off topic, but I, I, I don't think I've ever talked to someone who spent that long underwater. Is it, is it, is it really stressful? Is it, um, like, I, I imagine it would be like being in space where you're just constantly thinking like one little structural fault could, you know, end the game for everyone, like at any moment. Um, does that stress you out at first or is that something you just, uh, forget about and you just get on with your work? You, you spend a lot of time uh, getting screened into the submarine force. So at first you have you know, psychological interviews and you have little test drives underway where you get to feel whether or not you really enjoy the feeling of being underwater for a couple of days at a time. And then as you get more experience, you learn more and more about your 
capabilities and your submarine's equipment and all the safety features and all the backups. And so by the time that you go out there and you're getting ready to do 90 days, you're pretty confident you're going to pull it off. And you're actually looking forward to the challenge. I'd say the biggest part is Groundhog Day. Around day 45, you realize you've been out there for over six weeks and life is going to be like that for at least another six weeks. Hmm. And hopefully it's the right kind of interesting without getting too exciting, but not getting too boring. And you just have to find ways to grind through and get it out. And in my case, that involved a lot of studying, a lot of qualification, a lot of reading, a lot of uh, interviews and exams to get me to the next step in my career. So I found that I had plenty to keep me busy as I was qualifying and learning my job. That's great. And it is, and I'm sure it's great for uh, frugality when you get back. Um, well, it's either great or it's, it's the opposite when you feel like you have to treat yourself. But um, it's probably great for an already frugal person to then come back and then just normal, everyday things that we take for granted are just amazing after being underwater for 90 days. And then you can just enjoy those rather than you know inflating your lifestyle uh, like everyone else. I, I tell people that uh, you already know what it means to suffer deprivation. When you're in the military, you're keenly aware of what deprivation feels like. It's uh, the stoic philosophy taken to an extreme. And so when you get back in port or when you get back from the deployment or your mission's over and you're back on the ground, whatever your service specialty is, it may be just quite enough for you to go out and sit on the beach and have a good time without spending a bunch of money on uh, material objects or spending a lot of money on entertainment. And, and that turned out to be the way that I would recover from a submarine patrols. I just want to go hang out and enjoy fresh air and sunshine without spending crazy amounts of money. Right. So you so you mentioned you know m- military, and that's a great great way to experience deprivation. Um, what are the other differences between military and civilian life? Uh, you know, in the in the world of pursuing financial independence, um, I know you've written an amazing book called The Military Guide to Financial Independence and Retirement, and you know, you focus on military readers and you focus on helping them achieve financial independence. So uh, could you just talk a little bit about yeah, the differences between military and civilian pursuit of FI? It, it's about the same for the mathematics. You, you look at the math of what you have to save and how long you have to save it and how you want to invest it and where you'll reach financial independence. And the math calculator doesn't care whether your money comes from the military or whether your money comes from being a, a cubicle slave and a megacorp in some Midwestern state. The, uh, the skills, though, that you develop in the military uh, have quite a bit to do with how you'll reach financial independence. And it teaches you right off the bat how to stay motivated and how to pursue a long-term goal, even though you can't necessarily see the end, the finish line when you start that goal. You still know that you're going to reach the end of that process and move on to even greater success. And I think that military service members and their families, too, develop a, a quite an attitude of resilience and persistence. Uh, maybe it's stubbornness, but in either case, you know that there's going to be something better if you keep working on whatever is happening right now. You know if you can get through that deployment or get through that separation. Even as a military spouse, you learn those skills when you have to take care of the family and the home front while your active duty service member is gone for months at a time. And I tell all my readers that those skills that you learn in the military, let alone the education you get, the training that you get, carries over into civilian life. When bad things happen in civilian life or when an emergency occurs or when a crisis pops up, you've seen that. You've been there. You've done that. It's no fun to do it again, but you know how to handle it. You know how to respond appropriately and without getting too upset or without locking up. You also have learned to take a long-term perspective on how things are as a civilian compared to what they were when you were in the military. We used to joke in a submarine force that the average amount of berthing space for a submariner was less than what uh, the federal convicted prisoners had in their jail cells. <laughs> right. And so uh, we knew what it was like underway, and we knew how little we needed to enjoy life. And when we got back on shore, we knew we didn't need to have a 4,000-square-foot house and a great big car to enjoy life. We knew we could do it on a lot less than that, although i got to admit we do have a very big shower at our house. So that's what the military background gives you when you cross over into the civilian world. You've learned a lot of skills. You've learned a lot of uh, character traits that will serve you well in the future. And if you are the kind of person who wants to reach financial independence early, if you're willing to try to save, it can take 10 to 20 years, maybe even longer, to save up enough money for financial independence. But again, you have the motivation, you have the tenacity, you have the resilience and the persistence that you learned in the military to be able to do that and to succeed when reaching your goal of financial independence. So yeah, that, that brings up a, a good point. Um, it seems like it would be a very 
good path to financial dependence because as you said, it's 20 years and you you get this pension, which correct me if I'm wrong, I believe I read on one of your posts saying that it's roughly about, you know, a third of what you were, your salary was before you retired. Um, so, you know, 20 years service, you could have a third of your salary, which uh, I believe when you quit, you were earning six figures. So you got over a $30,000 a year pension, which uh, many people could live happily on. Um, so why aren't there many more reti- early retired military people? And I know this was maybe one of the questions I think you said that caused you to start the military guide. Um, so I was wondering if you have learned an answer to that question uh, over the time that you've had the book in the blog. Oh, oh, absolutely. And we've had quite a bit of time to think about it, time that I didn't have to think about it while I was in uniform, so I didn't spend much time thinking about it until after I was retired and looking back on it. And part of that grew out of uh, some Internet forums where veterans and other military retirees sat around and talked about why there aren't more financially independent military retirees and, and gee, why doesn't everybody want to join the military? And and the answer to the second question is that not everybody should join the military. It's a career that some people join because they want to challenge themselves and be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. They want to serve their country. It sounds goofy. It it sounds probably a little bit silly, but patriotism is a very strong force for joining the military. And some people see the military as their escape. I joke, I joke about escaping from Pittsburgh winters, but the reality is that many people who join the military see that as the only way out of a bad uh, situation in their neighborhood or their family or their careers, and they're looking for a way to learn the skills uh, or the characteristics to improve themselves. So joining the military looks like a good deal if you're the kind of person who survives in that environment of adversity and, and even failure from time to time. And there is a very harsh survivor bias in the military. We all read about the headlines in the newspaper, even though we're hypothetically not at war in some of the countries that people are serving in, service members are still getting killed every day. So I tell people, don't join the military because it looks like an easy way to get a lot of money and have a nice life and retire. The uh, the statistics show that only about 17% of the people who join the military actually serve long enough to earn a pension. Only one out of six service members sticks around, even in the reserves of the National Guard to reach 20 years of service and to qualify for a pension. Uh-huh. So when you join the military, you can sit in that classroom or in that auditorium and look around, and you might be the person that sticks around for retirement, but the odds are that you're probably not going to stick around for 20 years. And uh, as you look around, three or four people around, you are also going to get out of the service. Now, the, the numbers are different for each one of the services, uh, and, and I get into the details in that a little bit in my site. Uh, if you're in an occupation like a Marine Corps infantry or Army infantry, you're probably going to leave the military at a much higher rate and, and have a much lower retention to retirement than you do if you're an Air Force officer flying a, a multi-engine uh, jet. But the uh, fact remains that five out of the six people who join the military leave before 20 years. They take their experience, their skills, their training, their perseverance, and they take that into a civilian career where, again, they can continue to save for financial independence if, if they're not already closed from the military. So uh, the idea of joining the military should be done for personal reasons, not for financial ones. And once you're in the military, I tell service members to do it one obligation at a time. If you join the military on day one and try to predict that you're going to stay for 20 years, that's just a tremendous burden to lay upon yourself mentally and physically. And what happens is that you'll enjoy the military initially, you'll feel challenged and filled, you'll find things that you never thought you could do, you'll work with amazing people, you'll do incredible things, you'll have sea stories to bore your grandchildren with for the rest of their lives. But when you do these things, at some point, your priorities may change. It happened with me at about the 10-year point when we started a family. And I've learned in retirement since then, reading and talking with people, that that's very common. When you retire at 20 years and look back, everybody says, wow, that's great, you did a wonderful job. Maybe you have some physical dings and scrapes over the years. Uh, maybe there's a few shipmates who didn't make it to retirement with you because they died in, uh, in combat or in training. But when you're in the service and you get to that 10-year point and your priorities change, you suddenly realize that there's a very long time to go until retirement and it, the fun has stopped. So I tell people when the fun stops, it's time to think about leaving active duty for the reserves of the National Guard. And when the fun has stopped, it's best to do that instead of gutting it out to try to get to 20 years. If you do try to force yourself to stay for that extra 5 or 10 or 15 years that it'll take you to get to retirement, it affects your 
emotional health, it affects your physical health, it affects your mental health, and your family's going to be tired of dealing with you because you're going to be uh, starting the day grumpy and coming home even grumpier. So it's a bad deal to force yourself to try to stay for 20 because it's such a great deal. No, now, great. That I've tried, well, now that I've tried to talk everybody out of it, I will <laughs> say that when I retired, I uh, had a, a pension of about a little less than a third of the money, the total compensation that I'd been bringing home on active duty. And, and I'd hit the uh, peak of my career when I retired, so I was earning the most money I'd ever see. But I started a pension of $28,000 a year, and that pension is adjusted upward every year by the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, the Cost of Living Adjustment. So it's an inflation-fighting pension. Even more importantly, I have access to cheap health care. The uh, current price for the, the TRICARE Prime Health Maintenance Organization that I'm a member of is about $70 a month. And costs are capped every year. There's a, an annual cap, a catastrophic cap of $3,000. So I know that I'll never be spending more than $3,000 a year for uh, health care. Wow, those, those, those two are very powerful ways to uh, continue to save and to stay financially independent. And, and I tell people that even if you don't stay till 20 years, if you save that 40% of your gross income when you finish in the military, you'll be well on your way to financial independence. And if you work at any job for about 20 years and continue to save at that rate, you'll reach financial independence. If you want a, an inflation-fighting annuity, they're out there. You can buy one. You probably don't need to have an inflation-fighting annuity if you've got a financial independence portfolio of investments and if you're following the 4% safe withdrawal rate. And you know what the uh, Affordable Care Act has done for health insurance over the years and how it's made it much more affordable to have a, a high deductible policy and to uh, be able to leave the employer's insurance. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's dive a little bit into investments, actually. So, um, mm -hmm. so you've been investing since the early '80s, uh, right out the gate. Um, so, how has your investing strategy changed? And I know uh, once we talk a little bit about that, we'll dive into some of the mistakes because you gave a great talk about <laughs> some of them um, at uh, Camp Mustache, and I get yeah. to enjoy some of those stories. So, I'd like to hopefully share those with the audience as well. But yeah, just uh, maybe talk a little bit first about you know, how you started investing right out in uh, the Naval Academy and then how that's changed over the years? When we started investing in the 80s, uh, you invested in a fund by writing a check and putting it in an envelope and sending it off to a corporation like Fidelity or Schwab or a higher expense outfit. Maybe, maybe you were one of those weirdos who used this upstart called Vanguard. <laughs> And then as that went through the 80s, uh, I just continued to try to save a little bit more. Every time I got a pay raise, every time I got a promotion and earned a little bit more money, or if I got a bonus for what I did as a nuclear-trained submariner, I tried to save as much of that as I could. So our savings rate didn't start at 40% right out of the gate, but it ramped up to that after two or three years, and we tried to keep it at least 40% for the rest of the time that I was on active duty. It was easy back then as a military guy with a long obligation to know that I was probably going to be employed for a while. And so I invested in a very high equity asset allocation and we kept that up. In fact, uh, I've been reading uh, JL Collins, Jim Collins's book, the simple path to wealth, where he talks about maintaining a, a high equity portfolio of more than 75% equities. And we've been over 90% for most of our time in the military and we've continued that retirement. And so by investing in a high asset allocate, high equity asset allocation, that's given us a greater return. It's a definitely exceeded inflation. It's given us a good growth rate. It's incredibly volatile, and it's no fun to go through a recession with a high equity portfolio. But on the other hand, if you're not selling shares, then you just don't have to look at the prices during the recession. And by taking those risks, by living with volatility, and by knowing enough about investing and understanding the math and getting comfortable with it, you get a much greater return. So I was, I started out in a high equity portfolio because I really didn't know any better in the eighties. And that was the thing to invest in after 1982 because the stock market started to take off again and we all jumped on board. There's a feeling that the bull market of the eighties and nineties that, that led up to the tech wreck will never be repeated ever in our lives. I, I can understand that, that perspective, especially if you're a millennial just starting your investment time today. But the reality is that it, this history goes through cycles like that every 25 years or so. And while there may not be another bull market exactly like the one that started in 1982, there will be other bull markets, and they will be spectacular. And so if you get comfortable with volatility and can invest in a high-equity portfolio, then you'll do better in the long run. 
So that was the good thing about investing back then when we got started. And frankly, uh, we automated it as much of it as we could, uh, even to the extent where you know, we knew we had to write checks, and I'd write checks out in advance before I deployed and put them in letters and give them to a friend to send to Fidelity so that when I had a paycheck come into my account, my friend would send that letter in the mail to a Fidelity and make more investments for us while we were underway. And by automating it, you didn't have to look at it, and you didn't have to suffer decision fatigue every two weeks. You didn't have to worry about whether or not you're going to invest in that particular fund or this particular fund. You didn't have to worry about whether or not you had too much in the stock market or whether you should save more in a, in a cash account for some other project or for a vacation or for you know next month when you get out of the Navy. So automating really removed all the decisions that you didn't really need to face every time. By automating those investments, we were able to build our portfolio a little at a time, and it worked out over the very long term. I think I talked about at Camp Mustache how humans suck at estimating the growth curve of an exponential investment, and we just can't understand how it's going to pay off after 10 or 15 years, especially when you're only two or three years into it. The automation and eliminating all those decisions really helped a lot. Excellent. And any uh, any mistakes you made along the way that are worth sharing, just to show that you know it's not always a completely smooth path with lots of great decisions right from the beginning. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Luckily, I, I have a lot of material to work with there because we <laughs> made every mistake in the book. Back in the '80s, you would invest in a mutual fund that would have an expense ratio of as high as two or three percent, and some of them had front load fees of as high as five and three quarter percent. Wow. So, yeah, we invested in what we thought were the cheap mutual funds, the the low expenses, where you only paid a 2% sales charge and where your expense ratio was somewhere between 0.7 to 1%. Uh, In fact, I retired in 2002 just as the military version of the thrift savings plan was growing, getting underway. And my my spouse was in the Navy Reserve for a number of years after that, another, another six years after that. And it was just amazing trying to comprehend how the thrift savings plan has an expense ratio of 0.03%. Right. It's less than Vanguard even. Yep. And that's been one of the biggest tools for the military, I think, in the last 25 years to come along for accelerating your financial independence. So we also made a lot of classic mistakes that today we all know are, are tempting behavioral financial psychology, but are still mistakes. We, uh, we had actively managed mutual funds. We uh, chased performance. We attract all the hot managers and chase money into their funds and, and just generally followed whatever looked like the coolest shiny object in our path and thought we'd make financial independence that way. Today, we've moved uh, largely into exchange-traded funds. Uh, I'm a, a, a holder of Berkshire Hathaway shares for a portion of our portfolio because I've come to appreciate Warren Buffett's uh, perspective and the culture he's created at Berkshire Hathaway. But if I was starting all over again, I'd be working with the cheapest index funds, passively managed high equity funds from Fidelity or Vanguard. And, and I am sort of doing that by proxy because that's the path our daughter's taken. She's uh, been commissioned now for two years. She's had her ROTC scholarship at college, and now she's served in the Navy for two years. And she's fallen down that same road with the thrift savings plan and with saving as much as she can in taxable accounts as well as in her thrift savings plan. Excellent. Yeah. So that's, that's a lesson I hear from many, many people that I have on the show. It's, uh, that savings trumps everything. So you can make, you can make a lot of mistakes as long as they aren't catastrophic. And as long as you're, you know, consistently saving month after month or week after week or whatever it happens to be, then uh, exactly. you're going to turn out okay. That high savings rate overcame every mistake we ever made with our investing techniques. Oh, that's fantastic. And now I want to move into sort of what you're you've started investing in recently, which I, I really, really like the idea of um, angel investing, but mm-hmm. you also call it angel philanthropy, which um, <laughs> is probably very accurate as well. But that's, that's very appealing to me because although my net worth hasn't exploded into a number that I'm now thinking about how to get rid of it uh, efficiently, um, I'm hoping one day that's the case. And um, I, I believe angel investing sounds like an amazing way to do it. So could you just talk about that uh, just a bit more? And because uh, I know you mentioned it during the panel discussion. Um, but yeah, just uh, maybe dive in a bit a little, a little bit more. There's there's two important points to remember here. One of them is if you want to get rid of a lot of money very efficiently, <laughs> angel investing is here for you. It will It will strip the assets out of your account in an unbelievably rapid manner. 
because every angel investment that you uh, assess, everything that you analyze and look at, it looks pretty attractive. And at some point when you start learning how to do angel investing and you start seeing the pitches, you feel like a four-year-old in a candy store. You just want to run up and down the aisles and grab fistfuls of everything you see out there before this opportunity is gone forever. I, uh, I started angel investing at uh, what turned out to be a very fortuitous time to learn. I started in late 2007 and immediately ran face first into the uh, Great Recession. And that was just as savage for starting a uh, tech startup as it was for anything else in America at the time. And the reason I started angel investing back then was that a friend who was a retired Intel employee, also financially independent, was a member of the Hawaii Angels. And I thought, well, I've got an opportunity here to learn about angel investing in a professional organization from a bunch of people who know what they're doing and have decades of experience. And now, learning angel investing now, while I'm in my 40s and while I'm at the peak of my uh, cognition, or at least hypothetically, I'll be able to learn about it so that when I'm older in life and I'm in my 70s or even 80s and I hear about angel investing, I'll understand it and I'll have done it and I won't be tempted by it. So to some extent, I started learning about angel investing just to make sure I understood what was going on there and would be immunized emotionally against it, and I would understand that I didn't have to do it. I've done most of that uh, research in just about every aspect of investing over the last 14 years. I uh, spent a lot of time trying to figure out what kind of investor I am and trying all the different ways to invest to see if they suited my personality and my temperament. And the irony is that if you take a logical approach to investing, and if you analyze thoroughly, and if you can pull the emotion out of it, your efforts will eventually be rewarded. The harder you work at investing, the better you get at it, and, and the better you'll do. And, of course, uh, a world-class example of that is somebody like Warren Buffett, but there are many other people who have succeeded in figuring out how to invest in, in values, stocks, or in other types of assets, and have done well at it. For example, uh, many people do well with rental properties, with real estate. The only issue is that the returns that you get from investing tend to be a result of your effort. The better your work, the more you work, the harder you work, the better your returns are. At some point you say, hey, this is a lot of work. I would rather invest in uh, passive equity index funds that have very low expense ratios and get 99% of the stock market's return for about 1% of the effort. And the same ratio applies to angel investing. You'll work tremendously hard trying to figure out whether this is a good investment, whether you want to make it. And until you start writing checks and until you develop the relationship with the founders and the business and the industry, you really don't understand what's involved in angel investing and you don't understand the emotions you're going to feel when bad things happen. Everybody wants to invest in the next Google. Everybody understands how their emotions are going to feel when they get a 50 to 1 return on their investment. That's fairly straightforward. But Sometimes you'll come across an angel investment that has just a wonderful idea. Maybe it'll be a piece of medical technology that'll save lives and reduce infant mortality and do amazing things for humans. And you know that this technology, if it had a chance, would be a great life-saving device and would save a lot of lives and do a lot of great things for America. But for whatever reason, the founders, the industry, the technology, it just doesn't work out. And you find yourself having invested a little bit of money initially in it, Investing more money to help companies stay in the business and not run out before they get the next milestone completed. And then you find out that the growth is slower than they expected and the market isn't quite as big as they thought and the technology has a few glitches in it. All of these things you, you understand when you learn about the investment opportunity when you first see that pitch. But it takes a, a actual experience of going through the cycle of the investment before you really understand how that will affect you emotionally. And, and frankly, it, it bothers you analytically. The, uh, the most experienced guy I know at, at Angel Investing has done an extensive survey of investors. And he says the number one regret of all angel investors is they wish they'd done a little more due diligence and analysis before they cut a check. So I took that to heart. And then uh, today, I wish that I'd done a little more due diligence and research before I started cutting checks. Right. Having said that, uh, after eight years, I've made uh, about a dozen investments. Uh, I've invested in nine different companies, and I've made additional investments in some of the companies. I've also invested in an accelerator in Hawaii called Blue Startups. Uh, Blue Startups is uh, one of the top 20 accelerators in the nation. Our uh, strengths are that we're in the Pacific and that we're multicultural with uh, other startups uh, around the Pacific Rim and the West Coast, not just in Hawaii. And we also focus on things that uh, we're very good at in Hawaii, like uh, lifestyle or travel or medical tech. 
And, of course, any online business is very easy to start in Hawaii, especially if those founders like to surf. So I've, I've seen a broad spectrum of investments here, and I've learned a lot about the kind of people that need to be founders and what it takes to be an angel investor. And I've had, of those nine companies that I've funded, uh, three of them flamed out almost immediately, which is very educational. Right? <laughs> you, you learn immediately feedback on whether or not you did a good job analyzing that company. I, if your first investment was in Google, you learned nothing because the success, you know, clearly you're brilliant. Yeah. Well, I'm not brilliant. Uh, the other three, there are three more that have uh, been working on it and, and doing okay and encountering obstacles. They have not yet gone out of business, but they haven't succeeded yet. And they haven't turned into zombies, but they haven't sucked down additional funds from uh, other investors yet. But it's not clear yet whether they're going to be able to turn the corner and, and clearly make a profit and cash out. And, and those, I think, are the most educational because you find yourself going to a, an annual meeting or a quarterly conference and you say, here we are again. Didn't, didn't all these problems get solved last time we met? Is this, is this not working yet? Um, I've got three more that uh, are looking pretty good. And I suspect that I will get back all of the money that I've put into angel investing over the years. Some of that was because Hawaii had a, a state tax credit program that back in 2008 would give you 100% credit for investing in certain kinds of startups. If, if you invested $25,000 in a certain kind of startup back in 2008, the state of Hawaii would give you a $25,000 credit on your tax return. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a couple of decades before I'm going to have to start paying uh, state taxes in Hawaii again. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that deal went away in 2010, and I think it's made the uh, startup industry stronger in Hawaii because now we don't have a bunch of people chasing after tax credits. Instead, people are actually looking at companies and analyzing them and trying to figure out if they'll be a profitable company instead of just whether they'll get a lot of tax credits from it. Those three companies are going to take another five years. I, I might get an email tomorrow that says that uh, one of them is going to have an exit within the next six months. I, uh, I'm skeptical, but they're on the right track. And the longer they continue to do what they've been doing, the uh, more money they're going to earn when they cash out. So I think what I personally am going to do is not make any new investments in any new companies. I might have one more as a submarine veteran doing amazing things with civil engineering. I might invest in that. Otherwise, I'm going to let the whole angel investing effort draw down over time. Uh, and when I say over time, I mean that the investment I've made in uh, Blue Startups, the accelerator here in Hawaii, uh, that investment's a 10-year commitment. So I've still got eight years to run on that, and we'll see how we've done at the end of that 10 years. That's the whole idea behind angel philanthropy. When I get an exit, then I'll be able to talk to you about angel investing. So <laughs> right. you'll have to invite me back, but uh, Absolutely. don't hold your breath. And uh, it's, it's worth saying this is a small percentage of your total portfolio. This is your sort of fun money almost. You make a very good point there. Yes, everybody that tries to do something like this should limit it to uh, somewhere between 5 and 15% of your portfolio. And in my case, it's 15%. And that way, you don't do everything stupidly with your money chasing one asset. So, yes, please, uh, feel free to invest in things like angel investing or real estate or any other exotic investments that are outside of the regular traditional asset allocation, but limit it to 5 to 15% of your total asset allocation. Excellent. And now let's talk about something else that you've been getting into a lot uh, since your early retirement, which is surfing. Um, I know oh, there we go. I know, I know you're always excited to talk about that. Um, we should have let off with that. <laughs> right. Um, so that's something you picked up after you left your job, right? I, it is. And it was a joke. We uh, had talked about retiring and uh, people would say, well, why are you going to retire and not get a job? What are you going to do, surf all day? And so, of course, that became a challenge. <laughs> right. And on the day I retired, literally the day I retired, 1 June 2002, my uh, wife and myself and our 8-year-old daughter then, uh, went 9-year-old daughter, went down to uh, White Plains Beach on Oahu and took a surfing lesson from the lifeguard on the rental boards they have down there. I was hooked. I was amazed. I had never done anything like that before, and I was actually pretty glad that I had not learned how to surf while I was on active duty because I would have had a lot of difficult decisions about whether to show up for work. <laughs> right. But I've been very enthusiastic about surfing over the years, and it has a lot of metaphors with life and the way you live your life and the challenges you face, and it's always different. I've always uh, encountered different conditions that I expected and different things I'd have to do on a surfboard. It's become a metaphor for, for financial independence and for not working is that if you uh, have something that you are interested in that uh, it makes you feel happy, uh, challenged, fulfilled, 
Uh, if you've got some autonomy at it, that's even better. But if you design a life like that, then why would you feel obligated to go to an office and earn a paycheck or start a business if you didn't feel that same kind of passion for your work? Right. And, and in Hawaii, it's especially the case that many people come here and their attitude is, uh, I surf and I have a job to pay the bills, but I, uh, I live to surf and I surf to live. Oh, that's amazing. And it, it, something that I've noticed, I've like I said, I only stopped working on August 1st so this is just yeah the end of my first month um congratulations thank you very much it's been it's been great but one thing i noticed is that you know you can take advantage of things to the extreme so for instance like people would think maybe it's expensive to live in hawaii but if you have this constant source of entertainment that is just amazing that's right on your doorstep then you know maybe that extra cost is actually not even an extra cost because all of the other entertainment expenses that you may have had before are now gone and something i've experienced just over the last month um the local gym was having a a month uh discount on a gym membership for just a month and since we're only here another month i was like yeah i'm gonna give that a shot and yeah 28 pounds for a month sounds expensive and i probably wouldn't (laughs) have done it before you know before i had all this free time but now i have all the time in the world so i go every single day sometimes for two hours sometimes i go for even more to like rock climb and take advantage of all the things that are offered and it's like wow, I'm taking that 28 pounds and just like really maximizing it. And it's, it's making my whole day and whole month so much better. Um, and it sort of sounds like, you know, yeah, maybe Hawaii is expensive, but when you have something like that on your doorstep that you can actually enjoy and enrich your life so much with, um, it, it may not be that more, more of a cost. Uh, is that what you found or? Absolutely. I've, I've made a lot of friends uh, out there in a the surf lineup, and even on a day when the surf isn't very good, you're still sitting out there on a board, you're in water that's warm, you've got the sun shining, the, the, you can see Diamond Head off to the to the east, you're watching the birds fly by, maybe there'll be a turtle sailing by on the water, and you say to yourself, wow, I live in Hawaii and I'm <laughs> surfing. Is this incredible or what? <laughs> right. And I've, I've, I go out two or three times a week, and I usually surf for a couple hours. So it's a very effective workout program if you uh, build up the surfing muscle and the endurance that makes you that much better. And so you find that you're able to uh, become a much more efficient surfer, not just strong. Strength is not the key. The key is uh, be able to speed of reflexes and efficiency at, at your movement on the water. And so there's an endlessly fascinating number of skills to keep working on that, that all work very well for your health and your, uh, your agility as you get older. And I see people out there surfing in their 60s, their 70s. I see a few guys in their 80s. Wow. And they're not going to give up. And I can see that as I get older, if I do end up having more limited physical ability, that there will still be a way for me to get out on the water and paddle something and go surf away. Right. I, uh, uh, early on, uh, when I retired, uh, I'd say uh, around 2008 or 2009, my daughter and I took uh, surfing lessons from professional surfers. On, on winter surf up on the North Shore. And so we were out there surfing in uh, 20 foot waves routinely and we tackled a couple of 25 foot foot waves. And part of the reason we took that class was that my daughter uh, grew uh, a little more respect for the ocean and for water safety. And I certainly did. And the other one was to learn what spots on the North Shore you could go and try to surf and, and handle the big surf and still be reasonably confident you're going to survive. And, and I learned a lot about my abilities and my skills from that. And I've, since then, you know, I'm quite comfortable in anything up to 15 feet. Uh, above 15 feet, uh, it makes me uh, hesitate a little bit. Maybe I uh, pull back a little more than I should. I'm not as aggressive a surfer as I should be in big surf. That's really the main skill you need in big surf is to be aggressive. But on the other hand, I've learned tremendous respect for what a wave can do and for what the ocean can do. And I've challenged myself physically, mentally, emotionally over the years. It's a, it's a, an occupation that keeps on giving back. And you don't have to earn money at it. You just have to go out there and do the best you can do. Every wave is different. And every day you'll get a little bit better. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Hopefully I can come out there one day and you can show me uh, how, to, how to go and how to catch a wave. That would be incredible. <laughs> it, it's an open invitation. You know, people that come out to Hawaii, if you're out on Oahu and uh, you contact me and let me know what's going on, we'll either uh, go out there and do a surfing lesson on White Plains Beach or I'll, if you're a surfer, I'll lend you a longboard and you can enjoy yourself out here. Oh, man. Sounds fantastic. Yeah, you're, uh, you're putting you on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, before we head off, um, definitely want to talk more about your website and the book. Um, so the book, you donate all proceeds to military charities, right? 
That's right. All the uh, revenues, all the writing royalties that I get, I uh, donate to military-friendly charities. That's uh, Fisher House Foundation and the Wounded Warrior Project. And that's both income from the, the blog income that I have coming in and from all the writing I do. Wow. And, and talk a little bit more about the book because it, it's you've, it took you a long time to write it, right? Like five years or something and you talked to 50 service members is that correct? Exactly. We were on a financial independence forum, just a lot like the Mr. Money Mustache forums. The one we are spending our time on at the time was earlyretirement.org, and we had uh, 50 to 60 veterans and retirees and families uh, talk about what they have learned uh, being in the military and trying to save for financial independence. <clears throat> and I uh, crowdsourced it. We uh, decided early on that uh, we were going to give all the royalties to military charities, and the people who helped me write the book or or edit it, or that contributed their stories or their advice. They all got a vote on which uh, charitable organizations would get the royalties. And when we did all that, and we finished the uh, the writing, then I went around and shopped it for a publisher and found a traditional publisher. Uh, this was back in 2010. I've learned a lot more about online publishing since then, and I'm working on a second book that's going to talk about making good decisions about military insurance programs. And that's probably going to be a, a couple of shorter ebooks that talk about different aspects of insurance, like life insurance and health insurance and home insurance. Uh, and I'll, as I write them, I'll also put them together on a Kindle or a CreateSpace uh, feature, a file format, where you could buy the whole book in print instead of just buying the individual topics. And I'm crowdsourcing that too. So as I have military readers uh, connect with me and talk uh, with me about their insurance programs or their insurance questions, I just uh, collect that information and add it to the outline, and uh, I'll just keep writing books, and uh, that's going to go on for quite a while. When you're uh, when you're financially independent, uh, when you're surfing twice or thrice a week, or when you're traveling for two or three months a year, you don't get a lot of book writing done. You don't <laughs> feel that same sense of urgency that you would when you got to buy groceries and pay your mortgage. Right. But on the other hand, I have plenty of time to do the research, and the book uh, gets written and crowdsourced, reviewed, and by the time it's ready, I know it's got everything in it needs to have in it, and it's the right size. So we'll keep working on that, and that's part of the project that I'm working on now while we're on travel, and when we get back home, I'm doing less writing on the blog, I'm doing more book writing, and I'm doing more uh, reader questions. I get a lot of reader questions, a lot of email, and I love it because they all ask very good questions, and it usually leads to a new research project and a little more information that I can put on the blog or put in the book. That's fantastic. And all of this can be found at themilitaryguide.com, and there's hyphens in between the military guide. So is yep, that correct? Is that the best way? Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Nope, that, that's the best way to find it. We've been around long enough now that if you just enter the military guide into Google, it'll pop the blog up there right in the first page of results, probably the first or second result, and uh, you'll be able to click on that and see all the posts. That the uh, book itself is widely available in libraries. I know a lot of people like to have an electronic version for your Kindle. You can buy that off of Amazon. Or look in your base or your local public library and see if the book's in there. All right, yeah, and I'll, I'll link to all that in the show notes, so there'll be a handy okay. link that you can get to any of those places. And um, and then, yeah, the best way to just reach out to you via email if anybody has any questions or wants to chat. That's right. I check into earlyretirement.org every week. I'm on the Mr. Money Mustache forums every week. Or send an email. It's uh, nordsnords at gmail.com or contact me through the blog. Uh, again, I love getting reader questions because I learn a little bit from each one of them. And uh, if you're coming out to Oahu and you want to surf, well, we can handle that too. Nice. All right. So I end all my interviews with uh, just you know asking my guests what's one piece of advice you'd give to someone who's pursuing financial independence or hopes to one day achieve financial independence. What would that be? That would be track your expenses, and that will enable you to save as much as you can for as long as you can. But it starts with tracking your expenses. Excellent. Thanks very much, Doug. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you here next month in San Diego. All right. I'll see you there. We'll do another podcast. Nice. All right. Take care. Bye. Finance.